welcome. Welcome very, very much to Conversations. We're in pleasure. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program a friend, uh, uh, Ann Leggett. She's an artist and uh, has had an extraordinary life and has had experiences in places that are, to most people's way of thinking, rather esoteric in places that a great number of us would want to be familiar with, one being uh, Chiapas or Mexico and the other being in the country of uh, Libya. And she's an extraordinary artist. And Anne Leggett, welcome really very, very much to the conversation. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the conversations. Thank you, Harold. I wonder, maybe could, we, want, we want to talk about your, your well, to my, to my perception, your extraordinary uh, experiences that you have had um, among some of the less extraordinary experiences we all have in our life and so forth. Maybe you could share your own backward, background, as it were. I understand your family, the Leggett, I don't know if it's the Leggett side, but that it goes back to 1620 on these shores? Or maybe you could share your own yeah, background. According to a uh, family history of my grandfather's, um, the Leggetts came over as Dutch citizens with the Van Rensselaer expedition in 1620. Mm. My mother's family is uh, about equally old New England, but it's to be assumed that there were some other ancestors uh, already uh, from that Asian immigrant group that walked. <laughs> Boy, that really is early, 1620. That's just the time of Plymouth and so forth in Massachusetts, and the Dutch had been in. Well, I, I don't even remember my history well. The, <laughs> the half moon sailed up the Hudson back then, and uh, yeah, that's right, the very first beginning of uh, Europeans setting their feet on these shores. Yeah. 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 Well, so you're you're old American, as it were, for <laughs> sure, right? Well, and I've, I've never felt myself to be of any particular place except... Um, uh, sort of generically as a New Yorker, uh, but the world is, um, uh, I think the world is home to uh, anyone who uh, wants it to be. Uh, I have not felt um, very much less foreign in my native city than um, than I have in some other places. There's the convenience of language, uh, but otherwise... Um, either the world is the whole world is not too foreign, or else, um, um, or else New York is a, a constantly changing and uh, ever unfamiliar place. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I travel around the block. Yeah, right. I'm yeah. currently doing some paintings of uh, neighbors um, who are from just about every part of the world you can imagine. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's part of what I'm going to do in this neighborhood uh, series is um, uh, show how New York is a, uh, a place that's attracted immigrants from, from every corner of the earth. That really is, in fact, true. New York is such a cosmopolitan city uh, in itself, but I mean, I, I, in a certain sense, uh, but you also, you also have, it with, those, with those roots uh, that go back so far, could be a uh, you could be you could be one of the daughters of the American Revolution. You could have been part of the old line uh, families that tie you know have their ties that go back so far. Often with those kind of uh, geographical roots in a place, there tends to be a, a a very heavy association with that particular country and its traditions and so forth. You have, if I may, all, uh, have that a sense of grounding here within. The United States, but you also have a very strong political and social uh, conscience and a sense of economic justice, which has called you to be considerably, at the same time, you're a very fine artist. You've also had concern for economic and just, economic, political, social justice within the broader world, as it were. And you have a, you have a world perspective, I believe. And uh, you feel, in a certain sense, without putting words in your mouth, uh, to be something of a world citizen. Well, I'm. Um Exactly. I, I feel not at all rooted uh, simply because I uh, had a rather nomadic childhood within the New York metropolitan area, which is quite possible. Mm. And so I never um, um, felt the need to identify myself in terms of um, place or, uh, or group. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I rather shy away from any such identity. I, I'm nonpartisan. I um, uh, don't... Um, I'm not utterly without religion, I would say, but I don't belong to any particular religious group. I don't, uh, um, 
I have sort of general uh, habits of mind, but no particular uh, ideological bent, for example. So I find myself um, um, uh, being a rather adaptable person. Mm -hmm. um, I am used to the, the, you know, I grew up with the comforts of the American upper middle class, but I was also a poor art student, mm -hmm. um, you know, literally uh, gathering firewood on the street to warm my place. So I've, you know, I've, and then I went to Mexico. I lived in Chiapas for eight and a half years. Yes, indeed. In a rural setting, um, you know, among subsistence farmers, and um, I found that uh, not at all difficult after having been a poor art student in, in New York. Okay, you did your art training here in New York. Yes, right? at the Art yeah, Students League. I and studied then, with Frank Mason, who was a, a great um, teacher, one of the few American painters who's actually, uh, in recent years, who's actually. Um, has a recognizable school of uh, descendants in art. All right, fine. And we're going to show some of your work a little bit down the line and so forth. But you've done, you did that, and then you did. You just sort of went over it quickly there. But you did go to um, to, to to Mexico to, I guess, near uh, what is it, um, uh, De Las Casas, uh, or, or yeah. in Chiapas in the area, and you lived there, and you were not living there as a, an American tourist. You were living there amongst the Mayan Indian peoples themselves and actually learned the language, if I'm correct, of the peoples who were supposedly at the core of this recent uprising. And you are familiar having lived eight years among and with and mixed within these people in what is got to be an extremely unique kind of way. Well, um, in those days, it was quite impossible to live as a tourist in Chiapas because the, there simply were not tourist facilities, and um, uh, even if I had wanted to, but that's never been my style. I um, uh, went there with the intention of spending about uh, six months uh, on a painting trip, and I ended up uh, spending eight and a half years mm -hmm. uh, having found that I would have to learn two languages, uh, not just Spanish, but um, more particularly the Tzotzil Maya language. Um, and as I learned it, it took a long time to learn it. It's not an easy language. I want to talk about it. You then I um, um, found myself being, um, in effect, an immigrant in a Mayan community. Uh, that is to say, I became very nearly as much a participant as a uh, uh, person born in the community. Uh, I think it was very generous of them to have um, treated me that way because they were in a uh, situation which eventually led up to the um, trouble that uh, exists in Chiapas now. Mm -hmm. um, they um, uh, were treated quite badly by the Spanish-speaking people who were not the majority in Chiapas. They were actually a minority, but the uh, majority nationwide. And um, so they tended to be rather uh, suspicious of outsiders. And um, I think my being a total foreigner was probably a great advantage because um, um, I was not um, part of the group that they um, um, felt were giving them a very rough time. Mm -hmm. And and even then, in, in, in that you you were there. Let, let, let's set it here now. Where were you for the most part? Were you near where you were in Chiapas? Was it a particular town you associated with? You mentioned a language. It went over. I couldn't grab it. I couldn't get a hold of it. But it was a language. And could you set well, it up? They call it Batsi Kop, which means the real language. Oh, really? Do they yeah. really, right? And it's, it's part of, a, of the Mayan language. You know, they're not group. without their little snobberies, too. Yeah, right, yeah. This seems to be the case. But where was the town? What was the town? And in what situation did you live? And talk a little bit in the human terms about it who they are, what the language is, how they fit together, yeah. and where did you live? You lived in a relatively modest condition, or what was your situation? Well, I. I'm, Throughout, I, I maintained what I called a townhouse uh, on the outskirts of San Cristobal, various um, rented properties, uh, you know, usually of a rather humble sort. That um, would be San Cristobal de las Casas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, word. And it was the um, of the then I um, um, had a lot of friends um, whom I could visit and stay with on an indefinite basis. Um, uh, and then eventually a uh, uh, family that uh, were close friends built me a, a small house on their property, uh, which would, uh, their, their daughter was my godchild, and the understanding was that when she grew up and got married that it would be her house. I see. And um, 
So having um, gotten to know uh, the people and um, learned their language uh, with some difficulty, there was no written material available. So I hired the guy who sold me charcoal to, uh, <laughs> to teach me the language. To and teach you the, 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 the local indigenous language. Yeah. Right? And that was again called what? What is the name? Uh, it it, it I mean, is called Sotsil Maya, but they call it Batsikop, which means the real language. Yeah. And that Tutsik Maya, or that, that Maya, is that a language group or is that a specific language? It's a specific a language specific? within the uh, Mayans language group. And that Mayan language group is a wider group of languages oh, yeah. that are there oh, among yeah. the peoples of the Central America there. Oh, yeah. The uh -huh. uh, majority in Guatemala speak Mayans languages and uh -huh. uh, also and in, in, in several southern Mexican states. And can they communicate among themselves or are there distinct differences, absolute language differences, or is it like Spanish and Italian or something? Or what is the relationship of those basic language groups and cultures that are there, part of that, the descendants of that Mayan culture. We could just briefly touch on it, perhaps. Well, I've, I'm not a, a language specialist. Um, the closely related Celtal language in uh, Chiapas, uh, they're barely second, uh, separate languages. Some linguists consider them different dialects of uh, within one, one language. Then you get into Guatemala, and uh, it's a little different, but you can certainly catch words here and there. Uh -huh. And um, I used to get good prices in the market because <laughs> the numbers are, the, are pretty close throughout the Mayan language, Mayans languages. So I, I got the bargain rates uh, yeah. because people were pleased that I could and, and pound at least. And yes, indeed, so indeed. They could understand indeed, and be able to communicate. And you took it upon yourself to learn this language, which would be a very, very difficult thing. I mean, you're into a whole other realm. It's not like learning one of the European languages even, you know, I mean, it's much, it's a whole different realm. It must have been quite a struggle. And did you learn it well, or did you learn it, <laughs> yeah. did you learn it to where you could hold conversations in a, oh, in a really? You absolutely. Did. Oh, absolutely. I, I even, yeah. um, I argued law cases at the town hall. Litigation is sort of a favorite In that language, there. in that Mayan yeah. language, huh? Um, I um, had a reputation as a wit, which was partially undeserved because partly it was, um, uh, you know, the things that are not exactly incorrect, but a little bit f funny and foreign. Yes, right. <laughs> but uh, not altogether. Uh, I was actually getting into ritual speech uh, about the time that I left, which involves uh, improvising poetry uh -huh. in Sotsil. And that is very difficult. Uh, fortunately, it's usually done in a context where everybody is talking at the same time, so I could fill in with a bit of English, keeping the sort of sing-song meter, and nobody would be the wiser. But uh -huh. I, I was getting pretty, you know, acceptable at it. Yeah, that, 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 that's really, and in the process, of course, coming to know the culture and the people well, oh, yeah. and they're coming to come and know, and to, in a certain sense, trust, if that's the right term, or to be acquainted yeah, with yeah. you as, in a certain sense, one of them? It would have gone so well, far as you to know, say I was, that or I was, close on to that? Of them? course, I was a foreigner, but I was a familiar foreigner. Right. Really much the same as um, you know, some of my neighbors in Long Island City are foreign, but they're... Uh, but they're not strangers. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. of course, they participate in the life of the community, uh, just like uh, somebody who was born there. And are there cultures, the Latino culture or the, um, I don't know, the Latifundistas or whatever, the descendants of those, and the Mayan uh, culture, is there a distinct uh, distinction between those two cultures in Definitely. Chiapas? Definitely. And you were able to be not only in the Hacienda community, as it were, but you were in the well, community of the Indian I was much more in the Indian community. Right. Yeah. yeah. That much was pretty. More. That was pretty unique experience and interesting. Yeah. And it must have been. It must have been. An, and it is certainly unusual. Uh, you were probably one of a handful of people who would have had anything like that kind of experience. And I congratulate you on it and for having having uh, done that. Is there? Is it possible for you to to? to uh, is there? Po there is a poetry. Uh, what does the language sound like? Uh, can you, can you, could you say, I mean, could you talk to me a little in the language? Just to, the, this is the language yeah, of the you, people. I'm, I'm, I'm rather rusty. Yeah. Come on. What does that mean? What shall I say to you? What should you say? Say, uh, this morning for breakfast I had coffee, or just say anything, you know, just talk to it in the language. I'm just curious what it sounds like. If you could, uh, say, I went to the store today, it's nice to be here. <laughs> or just say anything. The I touch EV, I went to the market. Yeah. Um, you know, I am a little rusty. It doesn't flow off my tongue. Remember, I haven't spoken it for 20 years. Yeah, uh-huh. 
Um, well, okay, okay, fair enough. But uh, and then, but but the point is that you did learn that language and were with those people. That was there a distrust by those people that you could sense? We all were all heart, and we were hearkening and were focusing on that very area because that was the heart of where they had this recent uprising among the oh yeah and the, the, the European overlords. Believe me, it was it came as no surprise to uh, people who know the area. Uh, it, uh, it was certainly anticipated. You know, one thing that um, Mexicans don't like to talk about is that there is a good deal of racism there, which is of a particularly pernicious kind that um, uh, most people who are racist, I mean, racism is always wicked and non nonsensical, but mm. uh, most racists think that they belong to the, <laughs> the best race. The master race. And yeah. Uh, these people uh, thought they only partly belonged to the best race mm -hmm. and partly belonged to that very race uh, that they looked down on. Mm -hmm. And so there was a kind of um, uh, self-dislike uh, on the part of the um, uh, people who were in a higher position that made it all the more bitter against people, uh, the people that they were able to look, you know, look down on and, and treat badly. Um, so this is why I wonder, you know, my reaction when I um, first saw this uh, Subcomandante Marcos on, uh, on television, as soon as um, you could see him coming out of the woods. With the mask. With the mask. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, and I'm not going to translate it, all of it because I used a, a naughty word. I said, Buch uma di puta kashlane. Um, who is this so-and-so Spanish guy, uh -huh, anyway? Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so those Mayan Indians who know the language, you know what you've said, right? Yeah. So it'll get past um, the censors, yeah. So yeah. Um, I could see immediately that he was in no way Mayan. Uh-huh. Um, because, he, you know, he didn't walk right, and you could see under, you know, even through a ski mask that, you know, his features were not Mayan. And, you know, he is just simply, uh, then we learned that he was a, you know, professor, yeah. a professor from Mexico City. And I just wonder, how much for real is he in terms of being a, um, um, an authentic um, leader of an indigenous uprising? I simply don't know. I don't yeah. feel I know much about the situation. Well, through, these... Um, uh, you know, newspaper reports. Right, 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 right. Fair enough. Yeah, well, there's, there usually is whenever there's a real uh, uprising of some sort, there very often are people who are from various things. There, whether just We're going to have to move on because we've got so much we want to talk about. But do, do you think that there's a chance, given, let's say, some of the professors and some of the European-based people of the Mexican society and the social injustices that do exist, and which uh, are, this grows out of, that it could spell real trouble as far as Mexico or Latin America or even then it would affect us in terms of a, I don't want to use the word class based, but in terms of a underclass or a deprived people based movement that could spell and have real in a large scale dimension political or ramifications or do you think this is something that's just going to pass over? Well, I've, I'm afraid Mexico might be in for a long spell of, um, of difficulty. Um, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if um, uh, uh, that there's going to be trouble that you know perhaps pops up and dies down in various parts of the country uh, as long as the economy is in bad shape and as long as um, the uh, very very large majority of the people are are poor yeah and there is also if I'm I'm not sure and, and uh, the this will happen even where there isn't an ethnic component as there is in Chiapas. Right. Uh, about 15 percent of the uh, population of Mexico is, um, are Indians in the sense that they speak an Indian language and uh, live in an Indian culture. Uh, of course, most of the Mexicans are uh, at least partly of, of Indian descent. But um, there is plenty of potential trouble in Mexico for uh, very largely for economic reasons, mm -hmm. too. Well, and I, we have yet to see how it's going to turn out. Yeah, well, I think there's probably going to be a lot of people who are going to be interested in knowing uh, some of your thoughts on that because you are in a neat, unique position in terms of having lived in and understanding and empathizing in a certain sense with those people in a unique way. Uh, the, the Zapatistas are going to be heard from and all of this people are interested in it. But people who understand is very important. Now we want to move along, and that is because you, you so you, that is a unique background or part of your background. And then you have another area of the world that you've become interested in more recently, 
which is also in a certain sense for most Americans is in a certain has, has a certain tier incognito quality to it and that is the country of Libya and we have actually met in that conjunction and so forth and you've become interested in a painted uh, we're going to show some of your work that is uh, involved with Libya but you've become quite involved uh, with the people of uh, of Libya as well in the more recent experience right uh, yeah of course I've spent a great deal less time and um, I speak very little Arabic mm -hmm. uh, so far I mm -hmm. hope to True learn crime. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, again we um, of course there, there's a whole different problem there the problem is largely external and I'm afraid is largely of US making mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that uh, I've wanted to do with my paintings is to simply show that Libyan human beings are indeed human beings. They've been dreadfully dehumanized uh, uh, in the media and um, uh, the government, of course, has, has sought to portray them as nothing more than a bunch of, of uh, stereotypical terrorists to the point where I actually I did a painting once of um, uh, some elderly ladies that I saw at the airport and here were these very traditional looking old ladies uh, about to get onto a plane and go to Rome which is um, uh, seems symbolic of the you know how modernity and tradition uh, intermesh very uh, very much in Libya constantly well I was describing this painting to a guy who suddenly did a double take and I realized he had never thought of this is a normal human uh, population, including elderly ladies. Yes, indeed, of course. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, because they have been, you know, there's a tremendous disinformation and scapegoating of that country. I mean, I would say, you know, uh, having had some similarity, we want to talk about some of the, so some of the political, uh, you know, history of that sort of thing that both of us, in a certain sense, have been have been interested in. But I wonder, maybe this would be a time. We've been talking about you, and we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're talking to an artist here. We're talking to a person who has political views and social conscience and so forth. But she also is an artist, and she's brought in some work. Maybe this is a time when we could show Anne, if you would, and if you would bear with us. Maybe you could hold these. We have some of okay, her work. Let's see. And let's see if we can't come in. No. And, and turn the monitor, please, so that we can see it. And okay, and then if you'd come I'll try in to tight, keep my fingers out of the way. And she could come, just come in tight. There you are, and you could come in tight. And uh, so this is, uh, oh, that's magnificent, Anne. And these are, these are. Make sure we're in focus, please. And then you could come right into the painting if you would. Come right into it and out. That's magnificent. These are the horsemen, right? Uh, yeah. Riding in, uh, yeah. In the um, traditional way. Yes. Now these guys might be computer programmers or bureaucrats or whatever, and uh, they're doing it uh, for pleasure. Um, but it's uh, very much part of the um, uh, national romantic self-image, um, much as um, uh, the old West is here. Uh huh. Okay. If you can, we got about eight or nine photos. You want to go to another one, then, Anne, if you could, and then. And if we could just stick with it, camera, go ahead, come in. Oh yes, okay. The country scene. Yeah, this is um, uh, this is a potter's shop in the mountains, and here you have this um, uh, desert area where we've just had a terrific rainstorm in in the spring. This would be just south of Tripoli, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is um, near the city of Garyan. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got some city people um, uh, buying some pots from the potter. I later, this this painting was done in 1987, and then in 80, um, in in 91, I, I visited this very shop again. Well, there are now six rather large and fancy and rather garish shops where this one little one was. Mm -hmm. was uh, uh, this was as a result of some perestroika that they had done, which. Um, had a, a quite an electrifying effect on the private sector and no. uh, turned um, well turned Tripoli into a bit of a boom town no. and um, uh, the potters themselves said that they were um, making money hand over fist in this okay. point. Well good let's move right along let's get another and then uh, they're really magnificent work 
Magnificent work. These are all oils, are they, Anne? Maybe give uh, a sense of yes, the size. Yes, these are all oils. What, are, what size do you work in? These are photographs, obviously. Yeah, but what's the, the size? The horseman normally? one is very large. It's about four by six feet. Right. Um, I don't remember the size of a um, uh, pottery you shop. You tend to work large, do you? Now, this one is a very small painting. It's only yeah. 9 by 12 inches. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And here are some of our potters at work. Traditional pottery, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, okay. Now, this is um, oh, yeah. from my first visit. Um, it's a family on a balcony. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked a little art historical joke in here, the girl hanging up laundry. Um, is the pose of Michelangelo's Libyan Sibyl. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> Libya if, was the word, the Roman word for North Africa. That yeah. was the term, yeah. Now, there's another thing. Uh, see that green object that's hanging on the line? Mm -hmm. um, could we... Um, Go to the left a little. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's some, some green cloth yeah, hanging on the line. Yeah, just to the left of the picture, right. Uh -huh. uh, that is a uh, flag. It's a, the Libyan national flag. Mm -hmm. People would wash their flags and hang them up with the if you uh, move know, the, the rest the, of the house. If you move laundry. the camera just to the left a little, there you go. A little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, and up. That's the Libyan flag, which is a field of green. That's yeah. just what it is, strictly green. Green is the color that the Arabs and the Islam tends to be associated with, and they've decided to have it be just the green flag. Okay, let's move right along here now. And oh, here's another of, uh, gee, they're magnificent works. And again, these are all oils, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, this one is a, a sort of medium-sized painting. It's um, uh, some ladies hanging out laundry again. Uh, they have a flag, too. Mm -hmm. um, this is in um, the city of Misrata, which... Uh, is mostly known for having a very large uh, steel plant, I believe the largest in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, this um, um, this family keeps chickens and raises some uh, crops in their yard. It's a sort of um, suburban mini farm, uh, not unlike some of the places I lived in Mexico, but with a much larger and fancier house yeah. with running water and electricity, a, a, a very fancy television antenna, yeah. and a car, and yeah, uh, well, this it, is rather upscale third world. Well, yeah, well, it's not, it's hard to think of them as, they were in the, until, well, you change the picture, until the 1950s, I think they were among the very poorest people in the world. Then they discovered oil, and now they've uh, very quickly, within a generation, become, um, you know, on a scale of Europe or beyond in terms of their per capita gross uh, domestic product, and they do very well. They live very well. Or they are, it's hard to relate to them in terms of third world terms, but they have third world experience well, immediately behind remember, them. Remember, Harold, I've spent they've a good deal of time quicker. out in the country, and yeah. it is in many ways third world, although, as I say, it's rather upscale third yeah. world. Um, yeah. Okay. Here, here we're uh, in a very ancient uh, city. It was one of the. This is called Gadamas, mm -hmm. and it was a stop on the trade routes. It's a, it's sort of like the Pueblo Indian dwellings. <coughs> in that there are multiple apartments, uh, many of them in, in each of these structures. Uh, it's largely the old city is largely uninhabited now. Uh, there are as an apartment uh, that serves as a museum, but it is still very much in use because when it's very hot there in the summertime, and it could get over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I think the people, highest temperature ever recorded was in the country of Libya, if I'm not mistaken. I may be wrong. So I've heard. It was right up there. So yeah. people will uh, the leave their modern houses uh, when the air conditioner can't cope with all this, and they'll go into the interior streets of uh, you know the, the, these cave-like passageway streets of the old city, which um, are pretty comfortable even in the hottest weather. Yeah, they knew what they were doing a long time ago, right, yeah. to, to cope with the environment. Now we have some that are vertical, so good. Put those in. Okay, this is mother and child, is this? Um, this is a grandmother and her grandmother. granddaughter. Grandmother, yes. And um, they are from... Come that if you can. They're they from the tighter? mountains, um, from uh, a, a town called Cabao. It's a Berber-speaking town uh -huh. uh, south of Tripoli, I would say maybe 100 
and 50 miles, something like Considerable that. Considerable Berber influence. Maybe you could just touch on that a little in terms of North Africa and Libya. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the Arabic language came in with the Arab conquests in the 7th century. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, um, the, most of the people spoke. Uh, I believe there are several Berber languages, but I'm hardly an authority. Yeah, right. Okay, right. But the, oh. this uh, woman and her granddaughter and the rest of the family were my hosts in, in Cabal, uh, where I got to eat bazine, the national dish, for hmm. the first time. Now, bazine is a kind of barley polenta that sits in a... Uh, in, in a delicious spicy stew, and the idea is you're supposed to reach in with your with your hands, grab a um, uh, you know a fistful of bazine, and kind of mush it in the stew, exactly what your mother told you not to do, <laughs> and then convey it to your mouth without spilling the sauce all over you. Mm -hmm. And I had some beginners luck at that. I ate quantities of bazine, uh -huh. a huge quantity of it, and didn't spill a drop. Good for you, good for you. And that was a good sign of... Uh, well, you know, th this is a tie-in with Mexico because I was used to using uh, tortillas to scoop up uh, food and uh, generally not using Western-style utensils, so right. it, uh, it helped, <laughs> you know, to have had a little practice of that sort of thing. Okay, and you got what, one more, two more? Two more. Oh, yeah, there you are. Magnificent, magnificent. Well, quite, a musician. Yeah, quite yeah. literally, there I am. I used myself as a model for this character. Uh, she's smoking, which is considered quite um, unladylike in, in Libya. But in much of the world, I think, maybe. But anyway, in Libya, yeah. Um, but she's one of the ladies who plays at um, weddings and other uh, ladies... Uh, get-togethers, and they're supposed to be kind of colorful characters and perhaps a bit disreputable. Hmm. Um, you identify with this, do you, Anne? Well... <laughs> colorful and uh, perhaps <laughs> disreputable? <laughs> artists well, are... Uh, artists do tend to be. Uh, artists are, are yeah. not held in very high esteem, uh, even here. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid. And... Uh, we are assumed to be naughty characters. Uh, I don't have much time for naughtiness myself. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I've often had to fend off people who assumed that I yeah. was a naughty character. Yeah. Thank goodness for the artists, or we'd all be CPAs. <laughs> okay, what's next then? I mean, uh, and most CPAs one, are naughter, naughtier than I am. Yes, <laughs> right, right. All right. Okay, here's one last one now. Okay, Where is we're this? up in the, um, uh, the mountain country. This is um, a fortified communal granary in a city called Nalut. Um, these buildings are sort of wonderfully free form, you know, they're sort of like sure. manic Swiss cheeses and mm. these chambers are where people would store their uh, barley and their olive oil and stuff. Now this building, you can see a little bit of a rather rectilinear wall that doesn't go with the rest of the building. Well, when the Italians were trying to conquer Nalud, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, ruled Libya from 1911 to uh, after the, uh, to 1943 when they lost it during the Second World War. Ruthlessly, I might say. The Libyans, afraid, it might yeah, be worth uh, saying if I... If, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But uh, the Italians had been besieging the um, the granary, the casa, as it's called, and um, fired upon it and destroyed the uh, part of the ex exterior wall on one end. Now, after they had taken over, they were saying to the uh, notables of Nalut, "Look, we know that you need you need a granary." So um, the commandant said, I'll, said, I'll have my men rebuild the exterior walls if you'll rebuild the chambers. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's what they did. So there's this uh, you know, severe rectilinear Italian fascist wall on, mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. uh, on one end and uh, you know, the sort of happy free form. Uh, the Berbers are not fond of straight lines or square yeah. corners well. on, on the other. Yeah, well, okay. Well, they're magnificent, Anne. Thank you really very much for showing them. They're magnificent. You've got a Portfolio, you've got a, a fantastic portfolio, and uh, happy to have been able to show those works. Uh, I mean, it's really good, and thanks for 
that. And as you say, you, we, we, we were talking about that. Maybe we could begin there with the, the modern experience in, in 1911 or so. The, the, one of the, one of the mis pieces of misinformation perhaps people have about Libya, they have been, we want to address the fact there's two Americans who know that country fairly well, better than most, let's say. Uh, not to say that we know it very, real well, but it, better than most. Uh, that they've been tremendously scapegoated in the American consciousness. There's been tremendous disinformation floated in the American and, in a certain sense, world consciousness about that country. And, and one of the things that perhaps many people don't realize that I think might be worth starting in terms of the relatively modern history is that uh, Libya, the Libyan people, suffered what can only be called a holocaust at the hands of the... Uh, Italian. They had half of their population were ruthlessly decimated. A million people were actually decimated in what were, in many instances, concentration camps that were precursors of what was to happen in Europe uh, later in the century, and that they had what was a holocaust. Half of their population, men, women, and children, were decimated in what could only be seen as a holocaust. I think not many people recognize that fact. Well, I, th I think one of the remarkable things is that, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was a very sad and bloody history, but uh, uh, the Libyans are uh, not uh, much inclined to hold grudges. Italy is their biggest trading partner now, um, and uh, many Libyans have, uh, they travel in Italy, uh, they uh, they seem to be awfully good at forgiving, and uh, even while the trouble is going on, I've, I've certainly found as an American that uh, um, people w did not hold a grudge, even uh, immediately after the um, bombing of uh, 86. I was there, uh, that's where we met, and uh, in 87, just one year later in, in Tripoli. Uh, People were, were um, you know, very forgiving. Well, okay. And and um, <coughs> so I, I think that, you know, by now they, uh, they've pretty much made it up with the Italians and um, have, on the one hand, um, uh, the recollections of, of uh, a better time have uh, become a defining part of their history. But on the other hand, they um, they do get along uh, very well with uh, with Italy today. Well, time does pass and so forth, but they also do have a center where they're going out and recording some of the remembrances of the people who survived. And it's just perhaps good for us to keep in mind because that went right up until the time after the Second War. They're still having difficulty, and that they are people who've known great suffering and injustice directed against them. And again, to use the term. It was a holocaust that was delivered down upon those people. When you lose half of your population, I think it's something just for us to be aware of. Also, they were very poor in the material sense until the 1950s when oil was finally discovered. And then, of course, um, they, have had a, they are a country that went through a major social, political, and economic transformation when, the people, when uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the people that uh, took uh, control of the country, as it were, and established a thoroughgoing revolutionary development that has great implications as far as that country and the broader world is concerned. Yeah. Well, um, of course, it took a, a while for the uh, oil money to make a difference. Uh, oil, was, oil money was coming in for uh, a good 10 years before... Uh, uh, before the revolution came yeah, along, and uh, uh, many uh, people think that the failure of um, King Idris's regime to get the money out and into the pockets of people and into um, providing a better standard of living was the reason why that it, why it fell. Um, the um, revolutionaries were uh, smarter, and uh, I don't doubt that they were. Uh, I've met a few of the old revolutionaries, and they're rather idealistic um, mm -hmm. in their outlook. And um, but they certainly were effective in getting the money, uh, putting it to work, uh, raising the standard of living. Even their most severe critics uh, don't deny that they have spread it around to the people. Yeah. 
Um, of of course, they run into, and this is my last trip in 91, um, we, um, one of the things that became quite clear was that uh, they were in the midst of another big change, that the, um, uh, what the revolutionaries had done was put almost everybody onto the state payroll. Uh, <laughs> they had turned the country into a vast WPA, you might say. So that starting in 88, and certainly uh, it was in full swing by 91, they were um, encouraging people to go into business for themselves. Yeah, partners, not wage earners, they have a saying. And uh, they would allow for there to be private property beginning allow. to they were, they were, they were They were encouraging people wildly to go into it. My friends, the Potters, were about to um, apply for a loan from the municipality of Garyon, which uh, was intended to uh, build them a, a gas-fired kiln instead of the old one which worked on um, the residue of olive oil making and created great choky clouds of black smoke. Uh, so people were, um, were being encouraged to uh, form entrepreneurial ventures and uh, many of them were not seeing some obvious opportunities. I really wished at times that I were an Arabic-speaking plumber. I'd make a fortune getting the contract uh, for rural ho for uh, provincial hotels. Um, but I don't think, uh, you and I differ in that I don't think the Libyans are uh, terribly concerned about ideology. They reinterpret their ideology whenever the spirit moves them and whenever they find it practical to do so. And remember, things change very much in a country where uh, it was suddenly the um, um, where there has been such a sudden change where people are much more literate and more sophisticated about the rest of the world than they used to be, where there was a huge flood of immigrants in the um, late 80s and early 90s, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps as many as 2 million in a citizen population of uh, maybe about 4 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, so here's a country that's just uh, in the midst of, of very rapid change. They're, they're very resilient about it, but they can't get stuck in a mold. Yeah, well, I, I would say perhaps we disagree in some ways. I'm not sure that we do in all. But there, for some reason, there's been, uh, they, 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 have, uh, they have it to where they've uh, expanded uh, house ownership uh, to everyone. They've gotten education to everyone. They've been very liberally inclined in terms of women's rights are concerned. He's even taken, uh, Mr. Gaddafi and so forth, has taken some um, difficulty from some others of his Arab leaders as being a women's liberationist in some cases as far as the Arabic world is concerned. They have, uh, they have a saying, in need, freedom is latent. Education goes to all. Health no, no, goes no, no, to no. all. <laughs> and uh, they've also maintained, in a certain sense, a... Uh, a notion of uh, setting up what they call people's congresses, which is like a Jamaharia structure, which is like town meetings and echoes very much the sentiment that is being felt in the United States that they want participatory democracy rather than only representative democracy. I would say that they have come upon some themes that do ideologically resonate in the world with what could be a model to other peoples in the world, including perhaps we could learn from them ourselves. Whether or not any of the ideological challenge that they could pose within the broader Arab and Islamic context of events is the reason for there having been such animosity directed at a essentially um, benign and essentially good-minded, good-hearted people and what they've been doing is perhaps neither here nor there. It may have more to do with oil strategic, strategic questions or something. But we did, for one reason or another, um, bring our bombers to bear and to bomb that country and uh, kill scores of people in 1986, including the adopted daughter of Muammar Gaddafi himself. We've consistently scapegoated them, have them uh, branded in the consciousness of the American people as terrorists for events that were floating disinformation the, uh, about that, Events were floated in the press here that were later found not to be the case. The discotheque bombing that was supposedly the cause for bombing that country 
was found and reported openly in the press here that it never had Libya's fingerprints on that event at all. They've been mistreated and there's disinformation <laughs> floated against it. Can I get a word in edge, edgewise, Harold? Yes, I can. Now, <laughs> having said that, yeah, there is some differences and why. If there's why is the source of the disinformation and the propagandistic attitude that we've had toward that Wait country. Wait a minute. We've, uh, we've covered an awful lot. <laughs> um, first of all, I think that um, um, why I don't, uh, I'm not terribly interested in, in, in the ideology is that um, I do believe they reinterpret it. Uh, you know, I don't think it's really a very big deal there. Um, all of the uh, well-to-do oil countries provide health care and, and decent housing to, um, to their citizenry. Um, I think where, where Libya is different is that it isn't a monarchy um, and it, they are trying to look at some of the traditional forms of government and you know the village council uh, sort of uh, arrangements which did exist you know going back for centuries. Right, and, yeah, uh, right. I understand. No, I don't think it would work here. Uh, our population is too diverse. Uh, it's far too large. You, you know, it would uh, except on a very local level, say in New England villages, it simply would not work here. Mm. And we're a very different people. What, what, um, we do agree that they have been mistreated in the, by the oh, conscience oh, of the American people and absolutely. bombings took place and so forth. And why then? Why have they been so scapegoated by the United States and why do we have this uh, attitude toward that country which is so out of keeping with what you and I would feel the American people and the American society should have? Um, well, I think there's probably a grudge because um, the U.S. usually does not like it um, when uh, countries nationalize uh, the oil companies that were or the oil holdings of multinational co or and U.S.-based companies. Um, <laughs> they don't like that. Um, they do not like leftist rhetoric, and um, uh, basically the uh, Libyan. Uh, um, generation that made the revolution are uh, people of a certain age who were uh, 60 style leftists and I certainly uh, sympathize with uh, that general outlook because I'm one myself. Um, I think that um, you know if Gaddafi were um, a sort of bland and boring character in a way it might have helped because it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have made such a satisfying villain um, as a man who um, who is a definitely very colorful character and um, uh, is a rather good looking fellow you know, you, uh, looks good on the screen and um, I think that um, the, the U.S. had sort of gotten itself into, uh, painted itself into a corner. Once having made villains of the Libyans, they couldn't very well um, say, well, oh, okay, they're not villains. Okay, we know that that can be done. I mean, we've, we've had Jerry Adams and um, um, Yasser Arafat uh, being hosted in, in Washington. Uh, so it is possible to uh, make people... Uh, you know, to reverse the demonization of people. I wish we would try because there's no sense having um, a whole nation of people who um, are really uh, most disposed to um, be on normal terms with us and even to like us. Uh, it's, there's no use having, having such people as, as, as enemies. Um, you recently wrote a letter to the New York Times a few days ago. Uh, yeah, that was uh, published in the New York Times. I did. I uh, what was the letter about? It was Maybe in response share. to an article um, that uh, was about the U.S. toughening up the sanctions on Libya, uh, or seeking to toughen up the sanctions. And I said this should not be done because, uh, first of all, um, there is um, the rest of the world is learning. Uh, some things now that would cast a great deal of, of doubt on the U.S. story. 
Now, the U.S. claims that uh, uh, two Libyan guys put a suitcase aboard a plane in Malta, checked it through. It was transferred to the uh, Lockerbie plane in, in Frankfurt, which uh, subsequently blew up. Now, the Maltese had investigated could, and if, found no unaccompanied luggage on that flight. Right. I wonder if I could just set the thing for a minute, if I could, and then you could go into that, if you would. Is that uh, against the, I'd like to, if I may, just against the background of the fact that the disinformation that was floated against, we bombed their country. That was a pattern that was established. They said that they bombed the Rome and Vienna airports. They floated that uh, in the press. They did not do that. Yeah, uh, there have been something. There's been a consistent pattern. Again. There's been a consistent pattern of disinformation against Libya over a long and considerable period of time, particularly since Mr. Reagan's administration entered. Then there came this downing of the locker, and the, in each case, it was reported after the fact that the things they were accused of, they were not guilty of. It's important to bring that up. Yeah. It would be on page 86 of the newspaper after they'd already if been attacked. If at all. Attack, if at all. If at all. Yeah. Now they say that the plane, the horrible bringing down of the Lockerbie 103 flight over Lockerbie, they blame that, in more recent experience, on Libya, having originally blamed it on others, blame that on Libya, said it was Libya who, Libyan agents who brought that plane down, and there is now tremendous amount of evidence to beginning to mount, particularly internationally, that Libya had nothing to do with that. There are even members of the families of the Libyans, uh, victims of that, who are beginning to say, yes, they begin to see that Libya did not have that. And I bring up the traditional pattern and the consistent pattern of disinformation only as a backdrop to the fact that the disinformation that's being floated now about that would be part, possibly, of that pattern. And that's what your letter addressed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the yeah. Lockerbie 103. Yeah, um, but um, according to a report in the British um, Guardian newspaper, um, a filmmaker who made a film uh, <coughs> called The Maltese Double Cross obtained a, an FBI document that said that um, there had been no uh, package going from uh, Malta to, to Frankfurt and subsequently onto the Lockerbie plane, exactly what the Maltese investigation had said. But here is a U.S. government document that, um, uh, that confirms it. Of course, when the, the Maltese um, made the announcement that they had found no no such unaccompanied bag. The U.S. simply dismissed, oh, well, the Maltese, you know, we can't believe a thing they say. Now, also, uh, according to uh, a magazine published in Britain called Middle East uh, International, the U.S. recently released a document, um, a 1991 document, alleging that um, the Iranians were behind it and it was actually performed by a Damascus based uh, group, uh, according to some reports, the Ahmed Jabril faction. Now, I don't know if those allegations are true either. I really do not honestly have any strong feelings about who might have done it. That was the pattern that happened. I been do followed. have a pretty good idea who didn't do it. Certainly mm -hmm. the Libyans were not mad at the U.S. at that time. They were rather pleased that the U.S. was talking to the PLO. Um, the whole thing just makes no sense whatsoever. So Libyan did, did not again do it and yet there I are... I don't same, believe for a moment. And, that the, and there's increased body of evidence that's being shown internationally particularly but not in this country. Again the pattern of disinformation begins to appear and they're still voting and using the United the Security Council in order to vote harsher sanctions, still scapegoating that country for some reason one would assume. Yeah, well, Whether they want to be able to go back to their traditional scapegoat so that they could take pressure off Syria, well, so that you, they could make Harold, the coalition in the Gulf. Too much, but um, uh, one wants to happen. try and understand. Harold, imagine what would happen if these guys were tried at an impartial court and acquitted, mm -hmm. and acquitted. Um, an international lawyer who was close to the situation, I think you can well guess that it might be a mutual acquaintance, um, said that these... Born. Okay. Mm. Uh, these, he said that if these guys were tried, they would be acquitted mm. if they were tried at an impartial court. And mm -hmm. the Libyans have offered to uh, hold the trial using a Scottish judge and Scottish law, um, uh, but using a room at the world court and with an international jury, which is common sense. You know, 
a change of venue, I suppose, as lawyers would say. But from the point of view of the U.S., such an impartial trial had better not happen because, you know, what if these guys are acquitted? No, that's another question. There is, Wouldn't it be it, horribly embarrassing for the U.S.? Well, uh, yes, it would be much, it would seem to me it would be very, very embarrassing for the U.S. if the full history of a treatment of that country were to come out in the consciousness, and one wonders why it doesn't. There's a book I personally, since it's been banned now in the United States, as I understand, I particularly would like to let people know of it. It's been out a couple of years now. In fact, I show it here if they come in. It's called Trail of the Octopus. The octopus is the, uh, in the security uh, uh, arrangement of the United States government involving the DIA, Defense uh, Information Agency, many times larger and more secret than the CIA. There were allegations within the original story of uh, involvement of the DIA in drug smuggling through Frankfurt so that what could be shown if the full truth were to come out would be something that could be very, very embarrassing indeed to the, to the United States and involve them. Um, so the, the, this, this book is published by Bloomsbury Press out of London, incidentally, and perhaps ties in to the film and the fact that some of these things are becoming more and more available to an international audience than they are in this country, which brings us back to the fact that it's in this country UN headquarters are located and U.S. pressure has been exerted against Libya to the point now where Muammar Gaddafi has just recently in the press said that they have not been allowed to fly in or out of their country. There has been uh, sanctions that have been in, Ill, unjustly, if these charges are correct, imposed upon that country for so long that he has now said that he is thinking of having people fly to Hajj, defy the, bo the, the ban, fly to the Hajj in uh, May over the space, the airspace, and to, de de to defy that, and to consider dr coming out of the UN and joining with the Vatican, Switzerland, those few other countries, and saying that the UN is a hopelessly an instrument of the United States foreign policy, British French foreign policy, and has led to this pretty past. Yeah. That's just part of the context. Harold, we only have a minute left. If, um, if any of our Libyan friends, you know, if anyone sends a tape of this uh, to uh, Colonel Gaddafi, I would honestly appeal to him not to pull out of the UN. It is the only way in which Libyans might communicate with Americans, and it's, it's vitally important for them to do so. Uh, I understand why they're upset with the UN. I get upset with it sometimes myself. But it is very important to be able to be here and to uh, try to communicate with the American people. It's not easy, but it's something that is really vitally in that country's interest. Well, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And I was only, in a certain sense, directing my R at those forces that have consistently presented such a disinformation campaign, and I just as naturally am curious about why this is going on, and to allow for the, the truth to come out. There was a recent survey ca carried by News Talk Channel, uh, the News Talk Television, the new national cable service. They had a, they had a, a survey, and they said, do you feel that the news media in the United States is uh, covering up or mis misconstruing or mispresenting the news in order to hide a secret agenda, 99% of the American people said that they felt that they were. Only 1% said they weren't. There's tremendous distrust within this country, and one of the reasons and one of the contexts by which we might be able to have less of that mistrust is if we, American citizens, would be able to begin to make certain that we get the kind of information that is in keeping with the truth rather than a, uh, you know, than one that is perhaps convenient to the internal security <laughs> operation so of the wound United up. States. You're not going to wind uh, down again. No, well, we've come right to the end. I just, just <laughs> wanted to get those points in. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but Anne, listen. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Harold, right? you talk too much. Well, I know, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps.